that have pretty much 60 to 70 percent of a a full album for next year which is what dozen ish songs is what uh, you consider uh, this one's probably gonna be around 17 songs oh wow yeah i have okay. more than that for it i've just been moving songs in and out yeah, yeah, yeah um but that's like me fully diving into alternative rock hip-hop combination as a full project and uh i think it's one of the most important projects um i've 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 ever made Welcome back, friends. Today, we are in the fine line in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Only the second time I've done an interview here. This time, the lighting is correct, so I'm not going to be blurry, hopefully, uh, with an artist that I discovered on Spotify quite a while ago. And Spotify now is this handy-dandy feature that all of a sudden sends you a message and goes, hey, artists you listen are coming to a place near you. And it showed this artist, and I was like, who is this again? Let me go look. Listen to a whole bunch of songs and slid in the DMs, and here I am sitting with Kari. What's up, dude? Dude, thank you for letting me interview you. This is Rap. Oh, man, thank you for having me. Just happy to be here. It's my first time in Minneapolis. Which is surprising because Minneapolis is a huge music city. Like, First Ave is referenced in so many songs. I was supposed to play here last year, and then that show got canceled. Now that I just thought about it. Did you see First Ave when you pulled up? It's on this street, like, three blocks away. No, it is it. Yeah, with the stars all over the building. I heard it's, like, a famous, like... Yeah, spot. dude, like Macklemore talks about in one of his songs. Yeah. Everything's where Prince's Purple Rain was filmed. What? Yeah. Anyways, it's, all it's, all I really know about here is they shot parts of my favorite Christmas movie, which is Jingle All the Way. Here. <laughs> yeah, dude, with the governator. Yeah, yeah, dude, that's dope. Yeah, Minneapolis is a, a really cool city. This has been like the city I would come to to go skate when I was a kid. Okay. So I was like dreamed of coming here because I, I paid attention to like Wisconsin skaters like Greg Lutzka. Okay. If you know who he is. No. Dude, that's wild. You, like, disappeared from skating for a while. I'll talk to you about Greg yeah. later, because he won a bunch of X Games and stuff. He has a documentary out. He was, like, oh, wow. the king for a while. He's from Milwaukee. Okay. There's, like, no pro skaters from Wisconsin. But Minneapolis, there's a ton of them that come out of here. So once I turned 16, all me and all my friends would drive out here, park our car, and skate all damn day. Yeah, that's Minneapolis dope. is dope. Yeah, you got to pull me on, man. I took Dude. a little hiatus as a mention. <laughs> yeah, for real. Okay, but you are here on a tour of how many cities? And you're here with Abby the Nomad to kind of talk or to do a bunch of songs off your new EP. It's a six song EP called Icarus. Yeah. Right? So, how long is this tour? Uh, so, 11 shows in total. I think this is the seventh show. If we have five shows left, counting today, yeah, I think it's the seventh show. Is it kind of through the whole country, or was this, like, more uh, Midwest, East Coast? It's it's a bit of everything. He uh, primarily wanted to do, like, main cities. Um, this is his last tour, and uh, it, the timing just worked out, given that we did a project. We were supposed to tour together back in 2020, but right. uh, there are a lot of supposed to. They're supposed to happen then, but yeah. uh, no, I'm just, I'm just, I, I've been enjoying it. Um, I'm opening up, uh, and it, it, it's just cool. It's It's fun. It's just, like hanging out with a friend on the road yeah when you guys made that ep did you know that was going to be like his farewell kind of thing well i mean he has another album that's going to come out or whatever yeah. but did you know that at the time when you guys were doing that i think he kind of jokingly would say it oh, sure. i didn't know if he had committed to it yeah at that that time but even on the project he has a song like a verse where he says i might quit to hold camera as in like go work on like the film industry and stuff yeah it's like something he wants to get into Oh, shit. Sure. Uh, even when he said that, I didn't quite know what that line meant until he, he was like, oh, yeah, I'm actually. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. So how did that album come together? He was somebody that you met when you moved. To, do you live in L.A. currently or not? Uh, I lived in L.A. for five years up okay. until May. I just moved back to Providence, Rhode Island, where I'm originally from. Sure. Uh, but just because so much work can be done remotely or why? I don't love L.A., so you don't have to, like, yeah. prove anything to Oh, me. no, no. I, I actually love my quality of life there. Okay. Uh, most of the, like, my best friends live there. Um, everyone I work with musically lives there, even like a lot of video people I work with. Uh, but there's some family stuff going on at the end of last year and I kind of needed a break. I felt like I was in a loop, uh, personally. And it's one thing I'm good at with myself is like, all right, when I feel like I'm in a loop, it's time to change something and I will commit to it. Even if it takes me like a few months to like figure out how I'm gonna do it, but it's good to just take a change of pace. Maybe I'll move back there. Um, but I originally moved there in 2019, the like September 2019, the end of September. And when I first moved there, I just I was like, I'm if I'm gonna live here, I'm gonna work on music. So I lived in a recording studio and showered at Planet Fitness like a 
room no bigger than this, probably smaller than this room. Um, and one of the things I did was reach out to all my fans also like or similar artists on Spotify and just, oh, sure. and Abby was one of the ones that got back to me. And then he happened to have a show maybe two weeks after me reaching out and I just pulled up, said what's up. And then and just kept it casual and just talked to each other. And then he sent me a track that I procrastinated on for months. And then the pandemic happened. And I finally recorded that track and they were like, wow, we actually sound really good together. Yeah. So that was five, four years ago that that yeah, happened. Well, Something five, like that. five years ago when I yeah. originally reached out. Yeah. Okay. How many songs have you guys done together before this? They've been really sporadic, right? Because this is the first time you did like a project project. Yeah. I think long nights bopping in my room. He did another one for me. Peter Pan. <laughs> I think there's about six to seven songs we did before this project. Sure. I guess it's hard to keep track yeah. of things, right? Because nowadays, artists don't just release albums. I mean, they do. Like, you do release yeah. albums. But there's so many random one-offs, and there's so many features with other people that happen sporadically that it's kind of hard to keep track of everything. It's kind of a blur. I think what worked with us is that some t- most of the time, when you send a verse to an artist, it's hard. It takes a long time to get a verse back. Minus that first one I took my time on. We send each other verses very quickly. Oh, okay. And it's not like I'm waiting, or I got to keep hitting you up to get this verse before it's time to release the album. If, like, someone else is taking too long, I just send it to him. I'm yeah. just like, I like Avi. I might as well just have him rub on it. Sure. Do you, is, is he or are there other people that you kind of look to just for, like, critiquing advice? Because, like, I have another friend who does a podcast that's, yeah. like, relatively big that I will DM. Well, I just text him, but I'll text him and say, hey, these are the new thumbnails I've been like twiddling around with. What yeah. do you think of this? It's like hard to get true constructive criticism. So when you find somebody that you can trust for that, I think it's really valuable. Is he somebody you turn to or is there other people you turn to for that? I, I think we do send stuff uh, back and forth. I generally like to make sure something I really like it before I even get to that stage with people. Okay. And uh, when I do share things with people, I, I have to take into account who it is. Well, of course, yeah. So if... I almost don't send him things I don't think he would like. I kind of send him things like, because we have, sim- we hip hop wise, like our, I think our general music might be different, but like influence wise when it comes to rapping, like we both really love Lupe, uh, Black Thought, and just a lot of like underground hip hop. So we have similar influences. So when I, ha- I feel like something's in that vein or whatever, I'll send it to him. To be like, does this fit what we like? Sure. You know, yeah. <laughs> more more so than like, is this good? Is is like, oh, I know you like this type of style and you'd understand what I'm going for. Does this kind of fit within that? And then he sends me tracks uh, here and there and just lets me like, like, yo, what do you think of this? Sure. Yeah. When you got to L.A., I'm sure you had all the juice in the world because it's hard not to when you get there because there's like all this pressure. But you went there for like a mission. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. You get out there. You're like, everybody else is crushing it. I need to crush it. And I was doing that with the show for a, lot, a while. I would fly out there for like a week, get a hotel room, do like 10 episodes in a week and then fly home. And then I'd like stay home until I had the energy again. But it was like pretty exhausting. Like yeah. It really is. And it's hard to do things like. I guess purely out of passion or take your time with things because you're compare. It's easy to fall in the trap of comparing yourself to like everybody else around you. Cause there's mm-hmm. so many other hungry people out there. Did you have a pro like, did you struggle with that kind of mentality out there? Was it exhausting for you or was it something that was really motivating for you? Honestly, I don't know if I even really had the time to compare as much as like <laughs> my reality was like, I'm living in a, studio <laughs> yeah sure. and showering at planet fitness yeah. and then the pandemic happened so i had to like shower my friend who just happened right before the pandemic to move down the street from where i was living in downtown la um so i was more focused on that and prior to living in la most of what i've made like 90 percent, maybe 95 percent, was people sending me beats so i did not work in session i didn't i didn't build that muscle yet so a lot of my living in LA when I first moved there was literally living in a recording studio and working in person for the first time. Yeah. And learning that, I was just focused on that. Just like, how do I get myself good enough to walk into any room and know my value and feel it inherently as opposed to like, I'm a little shy, you know, this guy's a big producer or this guy is a good rapper or they seem very sure of themselves. I was focused on just trying to become sure of myself um, more than anything. And I think 
the my my situation forced like I really just didn't have time to think of much and then the pandemic happened I'm still living in a recording studio right. and I don't have anything else to do so yeah. yeah yeah but I think a lot of people kind of start out that way right because yeah. they're not where a recording studio is they don't have friends that are in that you know space they don't have a bunch of producer friends that they're used to working with who's the first producer that you worked with that you felt really meshed well with you and what did you learn from it um so my homie mike irish who records most of my music and produces a lot of my newer stuff and albums he's always produced things here and there for me and he works with a lot of other people he used to run a big recording studio in um in greenpoint in brooklyn uh but me and him i think we gel the most out of anyone i work with uh me and abby gel pretty well actually is he producing stuff yeah, so he produced, uh, I have a song about Pizza Guy that I came out with, uh, Americana that I came out with. Um, he produced um, maybe two or three tracks on our project together. Okay. But I think at this point, via that, like, grinding it out, I can work with probably anyone at this point. Sure. I don't feel like there's a room I can't walk in and add value to in so capacity. Did, was there like a moment in time that you remember that happening? For me, it was like I interviewed, I told you off mic earlier, I interviewed this illusionist, right? Mm -hmm. His name's Wayne Hoffman. He's been on Ellen and every major TV show. He's like, he reads minds. Like, that's his shtick, right? Wow. And so I got connected to him during the pandemic, and he was the first, like, successful person that I interviewed that I had no real connection to. I'd never met. Yeah. And I remember being really nervous. I was driving to his place. I had to go through like a security checkpoint where they looked at my ID, you know, like gated community and super nervous for it. Pulled up, he opened the door and like, I just wasn't nervous anymore. He just disappeared. Dude, for real. And That's I mean, dope. that was like 40 some interviews or something in, but that was the last time that I was like, I feel like I'm really lucky and I don't deserve to be here, you know? Mm -hmm. But like from that moment and then on, I just haven't really been nervous for interviews and felt like, yeah, I could interview kind of anybody. Like I interviewed Genuine like uh, not long ago at this music festival. And it was just, I was back there, saw his manager. I was like, you think he'd hop on a mic? And he goes, oh yeah, I can get him. I was like, all right, dope. You know, I just sat down, did the thing really quick. It was, it was cool, you know, yeah. like, but that was the turning point for me. Was there a turning point for you? It happened around 2022 or coming out of the pandemic. Uh, I'm truly not sure if it was me taking for the first time <laughs> dude change the way you think for sure i think around the time of me taking and it might not be related to but it just might be just coming out of the pandemic and just like life is different and we all just spend a lot of time alone yeah but i've changed my way of thinking of music even when it comes to performing to i hope they really like me to for, from from i hope they really like me to i really like me I hope they have fun and enjoy it, but I'm going to enjoy it. Like, when I go on stage, I don't think about doing a good performance. I think about entertaining myself and what will be entertaining to me. Yeah. And hopefully that energy radiates to other people. And I think the same way I go into a session now or when I work on music, it's not like, I'm not worried of, like, what is the producer thing? What is, I mean, I do care, but I'm not. It's almost that I, I know I ha it, it took a while to realize I know I have value. And I don't know if that just comes from doing something for long enough to the point where you're just like, oh, I can repeat. Uh, it, it's not like, oh, I made this one song and I'll never make a song as good as that. I'm sure I can make a song as good as the best song I've ever made or yeah. the most successful song. And I, maybe that just comes from repetition or it comes from the I truly have no clue. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a, a little bit of that is just, yeah, confidence with yourself. I interviewed my brother-in-law a long time ago, um, like second season of my show. I stopped counting seasons at like season 12 or something. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but anyways, he had said something like, you, you have to be your biggest fan first. Mm -hmm. You know, which that kind of changed my way of thinking of it, of like, because you don't want to be cocky. Like, God, I love what I do so much. Yeah. But it, it's more like if you don't really genuinely love what you're putting out, how can you expect or ask anybody else to love it? Yeah. But like you that's, have to love it. That's facts. I, and I've also changed my relationship with cocky. And when I see people who are cocky, my question is, is it deserved? 
Sure. Like I saw an IG video of this guitarist. I don't. He was playing for someone famous. I can't remember who it was. And he was like showboating. You could see it in his face. And then the comments were like, "Man, this guy is really full of himself." And uh, and I was I was thinking about it. That was my initial reaction. And I sat there for like maybe like another ten seconds. I was like, eh, I think if I put in as much work to be as good as that dude, I'd probably I'd I'd, I'd pull my guitar out on dates like that's, <laughs> that. It, and that's I've kind of changed my my outlook on that. Uh, in the sense of, I think once you've put in a certain amount of time or a certain amount of repetition, it, it's good to be delusional, but when your delusion is now backed by years or hours of reinforcement to yourself, it, it's it's a different conversation. Yeah, well, and I think fun is infectious, mm-hmm. and you need to be having fun. And if you're having fun, who cares if people don't like you, man? Like, who's, yeah. the, who's the person that everyone loves at, at a party the most? It's the person who's having the most fun, kind of regardless of what they look like or if they're making a fool of themselves or whatever. Like, that's who everyone gravitates towards, right? And so if you're having fun, even if it's looking like you're showboating to some, they're just being haters, whatever. You're going to attract more people rather than, again, if you're just kind of, like, self-conscious and you don't know what to put out, whatever, you're not going to attract anybody. It's better to have a bunch of people that like you and some that dislike you than nobody care. And everyone just needs to go to Spotify, look you up. K-H-A-R-Y, hit the follow button, and then listen through the whole catalog of music, because there is a lot. Approximately how many songs do you think there are out? Over 70 at this point, maybe even 100. So you got hours to listen to. Let's talk about the anime thing, dude. I think that's cool. Like, rappers, anime is like this nerdy thing, you know what I mean? But it's yeah. I've noticed that our age group, as like we, because we're about the same age, yeah. as we've grown up, all of a sudden I'm hearing people reference Pokemon. All of a sudden I'm hearing people reference Dragon Ball Z and like, not like people that people are making fun of. You know what I mean? People that you think are cool and you're like, Oh wait, they're nerdy too. So what's up with the anime thing? Did you grow up watching a lot of that or what? Uh, I did. I think as most Americans, your introduction is like Dragon Ball Z. After Uh, school, right? You get off the bus and then it's on. (laughs) Yeah. My favorites of all time are Yu Hakusho and Cowboy Bebop. No filler episodes and just very, I just like that anime style of things. But I think as a kid, I, in a weird way, anime was counterculture at that time when I was like younger, or maybe when we were younger, um, and it kind of goes hand in hand with me being into skating, me being into uh, the music I was into at the time. Which was what kind of music? More like like hip hop really opened up for me when I heard Lupe Fiasco. Sure, and he probably opened up the whole rapping about anime thing for everyone i would say i can't think of a song where he references it offhand but i'm not like a huge lupe fan in particular he has like he he references a lot of like the i don't know if he references like dragon ball z in the way we did but like more so like the i want to say the astro boy sure world of things and then his uh connection to japanese like fashion and streetwear at the time was just not wrapped about and yeah uh, the component he did, and I think he just opened up, whether he directly said it a lot, uh, a lot of songs or not, his existence as someone who was like, because I remember I used to have a big fro for most of middle school, I think it was, and then going into ninth grade, I cut it off. I had wireframe glasses, and I also used to, I started skateboarding around that time, so when I got to school that year, everyone kept calling me Lupe. I had no clue who he was, and this was MySpace days, and I, I went on MySpace, scroll down, first video I saw was daydreaming, and I saw this guy rapping about robots. Sure. Looking nerdy, but also dressed cool. And like, that opened up, at least for me, I was like, oh, I I can talk about other things. Like, I can just be me yeah. and exist, and I, I think that's how, if I had to really think about on like a grand scale, I would say he probably is why the anime is cooler to rap about. And... I think we've also just we've just grown up like wrestling wasn't that cool like people were into wrestling but now people are like openly into wrestling yeah 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 you know well I think it's part of just the internet right is like you used to have to fit into a certain box yeah because you had to be backed by certain people and these were the only things you could fit in like skateboarding as an example mm-hmm. if you go back to like Tony Hawk's Underground you had to pick one of like four teams because you had to fit in one of those four aesthetics yeah yeah and if you didn't like who were you you know, and in skateboarding now, too, I pull a lot of things to compare to that because that was, like, my industry forever. 
Um, but now there's so many different brands. You can kind of find your community regardless of what your weird is. Mm -hmm. Like whatever that thing is, there's something that fits with that. And people, I think, are looking for that with music in a lot of ways too. Maybe not in like what's in pop and radio, but like, I mean, what well, with Spotify or everything, there's artists are like pushed more so to be creative and u more unique rather than trying to fit within a certain sound. Yeah. I have a give and take on that. I think there's more boxes to fit in, but algorithms do push us to fit in boxes. Yeah. Because as widespread as, like, hip-hop is and as many different sounds as there are, it's very easy to get lost in algorithm world of Spotify if it can't, like, place you. Like, if this song sounds like this and then the next one sounds completely different, it, it does get pretty hard. I think... As far as niching down, um, the real thing to me is how you tell your story. And I think that allows you to break past the like boxes, but I do think this world does kind of push you towards boxes right now. How do you tell your story, though, if albums aren't much of a thing people listen to anymore? Because that was kind of part of the point of an album, right? It's yeah. like you could tell a whole story arc within it. Now, people's albums, when they do put them out, a lot of times they're short things like LPs because they just know, other than their core fans it's rare to find somebody to hit start on the first song and listen to the whole thing all the way through. Uh, I, I think I, I just think we're in a very visual world and the people who are killing it and will kill it in the next, like over the next five to 10 years are the people who learn how to tell their story through a uh, shorter form video. It's not like a new thing I'm saying right now, but I think what's, what's missing in the convo and i don't think people realize it it's not about just trying to go viral it's literally but how do you convey who you are in that story story just runs everything it, i think i would argue it probably already always has as far as media is involved but i think today more than ever in the format is it just isn't like what we're used to it's all these little micro moments of who you are that yeah. build up and compound and slowly the snowball is building that rolls down the hill when things are going good for you and hits at the right moments. Like I watched Tizo touchdown do it in such a cool way uh, from the beginning of the pandemic to where he's at now. And it, he literally had this like garage that he would do songs in front of every time. So every time you saw that garage, you know, it was Tizo. Every time you saw the nails in his hair, you know, it was Tizo. He had little skits when he was doing uh, interviews he would almost, I think he recorded his interview or something for one of the content. It's it like a crazy way of doing it, but you got all these little micro moments of him that built up to who he is now. And I think the the future of storytelling as an artist is learning how to do that uh, over a longer time period. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's hard for a lot of people, though, because they see a trend and they try to reenact a trend or whatever because they're yeah. trying to go viral. Yeah. But the problem is if you're really trying to go viral and you're not thinking about, like, how does that fit within what I want to do long term? Mm -hmm. It's a challenge, right? Like, I did a dumb little video of my dog just because, like, I, he's my biggest coworker. Like, I, I spend a lot of time working from home, you know what I mean? And I he's always sitting there shaking, looking at me like, hold me. And so I did a dumb little video where I was, like, interviewing my dog, Yeah, you know, just because I thought it was funny. And then that was the, the best performing video I've ever put on the Internet. I had a whole uh, bunch of people follow me for my dog. For your dog. And then I'm getting DMs and comments of like, where's the dog? And I'm like, wow. but that's not. That's not like, the full. He's next to me. That's where he is. But that's not the point of why I do what I do. So I feel like compelled. Like I have to show my dog periodically, which yeah. was not the point in the first place. There's two takeaways from that. Well, one is be careful what you get known for. Yeah, for real. The second is. It's almost like. We don't get to decide what's interesting about us. People will tell us. Sure. Uh, like, I I didn't get the night helmet to look cool. I just thought it looked cool. I saw someone wearing a night helmet on TikTok. Pretty sure the same one. I think I found it on eBay or something like that. I can't remember. And then I used it in, like, a clip. And people kept commenting on the night helmet. And I'm like, I guess it's part of what I, what I do now. Or, um blending alternative rock and hip hop uh that's something i ca it came natural it was like something i got into but when i was looking at my last project or like last album album i made the songs that stuck out were the ones in which i had hip hop and alternative rock um involved 
I think that the, the one you be careful what you're known for. But if if people kind of point out something, it's not necessarily a bad thing. If it's something that's authentic to you, I just find it like. It's almost like people kind of let you know what's cool about you, and you should probably lean into it. Like, sure. me getting back into skateboarding, I'm not a professional, I'm not anything crazy, but I noticed when I shared clips of me, like, learning how to skate or trying new tricks, I got followers and people resonated with that. And the music I make, which is lately has been alternative rock and hip-hop, kind of coincides with that. So just, I've been accenting these things about my life. Uh, that online has told me resonates. Yeah. Well, I think people like when people are relatable, yeah. but like if you can find one part of that, right? Like people look at you and they love your music and you've had a long career. Yeah. In that way, they can't see, they can't compare themselves and see like you're out of reach, mm -hmm. right? Musically for most of the people who see yeah. you versus seeing you suck at skateboarding. You don't suck, but I'm yeah. just saying like when you're yeah. getting back into whatever, yeah. you're like, oh, like that's, relate like that's something i could yeah. maybe do it makes you more within reach and seem like more of a real person like a peer which makes them want to root for you and want to follow along with that journey and support it uh yeah pretty, pretty much <laughs> i'm gonna say the most guru corny thing that's just been in my head lately but i i think we're kind of pushed to go viral and uh instead what we should try to be is aggressively ourselves so we're being viral as opposed to trying to have this moment or because then you're just chasing trends or trying to chase something that works if it's not authentically you or if it's not what you want to present you're going to get bored of it and people are going to realize it's not really you or they're going to be waiting for that clip again uh in which you're this the thing that went viral but if you are viral and you're aggressively yourself as in like true to things that feel or presenting yourself with, with things that are true to you, when something does resonate, you don't even have to try and go viral again. It's just you. Sure. Yeah. Well, and I think you have to, like, you see what kind of works, and yeah. so you're, you're pushed to do that. And everyone's working hard, so they push themselves too hard to try to get whatever. But I think a lot of times people get away from what they enjoyed about it. Yeah. Because they're trying too hard to make this thing successful. And sometimes it's okay to not hit a certain... Peak, like to not peak you know yeah. what i mean it's okay to have it be a slower thing as long as you're actually remembering to enjoy everything that's happening along that way like with the show a lot of people the biggest advice i've gotten from a ton of people is i need to niche down more and i mm. get it dude i get it if i did this podcast and it was just musicians in minnesota or something <laughs> it would be easier to market it because yeah. the people who see me they're like oh you just interviewed this dude who goes to breweries i like that but i don't want to listen to this dude who's talking about rap music yeah but i wouldn't enjoy it Mm -hmm. If that's all I did. I don't play music, man. I don't even make music. So I don't want to talk to people about music exclusively all the time. Then all of a sudden, this would become just another job. Yeah. I'd, I interview people that I personally am really interested in interviewing, and that happens to be kind of all over the place. So mm -hmm. has it been a slower journey to get to a level of success? Yeah, probably, but I can pay my bills now. Yeah. You know, I don't make a ton of money, but I can pay my bills off doing this, and I get to, like, just hit up people that I see, oh, artists I like on Spotify. Is coming to like Minnesota, tight. <laughs> and uh, I would say you doing it the way you want to do is kind of niching down. Sure, you know, yeah. Like you're, it might be widespread as in people you talk to, but it's like widespread and in you're interested in, right? So it's so when something does pop off or whatever, it's going to be because you like it. It's going to be something that's authentically you. Yeah, I think it'll be something I can build off from there. I want to get to another yeah. song. Who's your favorite pro skateboarder? Damn, that's a good question. I was like out of left field, <laughs> but you're wearing an independent truck yeah, company t-shirt yeah. underneath your hoodie. So <laughs> I'm trying to think who's my favorite right now is a good, I, I mean, I, I really like watching you though. I, I watch SLS. Dude. Yeah. Uto is amazing. I saw him. He came to Minneapolis for X games. Did he? Years and years ago. Oh, yeah. That dude's incredible. And then watching him in the Olympics back to back gold medals. Yeah. It, it's, it's just. <sighs> so if he was going to hit you up, for his next part, his next part on for April or Nike or whatever, and yeah. he wants a song, you're going to say yes. What song would you want him to use of yours for his next video part? <laughs> maybe, maybe, oh, it's kind of on the nose. Yeah, let's just be on the nose or whatever. I don't know if this is the exact song I would think of if I had more time, but let's just say uh, a song with me, by me and Abby called Skate Park. 
I don't want to go like too far deep on the skateboarding thing, yep. but why did you get back into skateboarding? Because not that many people do that. Once they find a lane of what they're good at, yeah, it's like hard to go be bad at something almost as an adult because you like expect to yourself to be good at everything for some reason, which isn't possible. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it takes some humi- level of humility to pick up something going, well, I'm not great at this. I, I think... One, I really like puzzles. And skateboarding is just a big puzzle with me that you just get to do with your body. Uh, but two, I, I realized like two years ago, I had no real hobbies in life outside of just being in, being in, making music and being in my head about music when I'm not making music. So um, I was living at Echo Park in LA and there's a skate park, maybe like a five minute, 10 minute walk from me. Um, so that made me want to get get back into it. And as I started doing that, um, I just started adding other hobbies in my life. Like, I really like playing pool. Um, billiards. 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, but another part of it, I, I think, so I had a project called Internet Cram in 2016 that kind of blew up things for me. Uh, this YouTuber where, like, a million, two million subscribers just started randomly using my songs as outro songs. And that just got me a lot of fans. Uh, I caught, like, soundcloud at its peak i caught spotify at the beginning of it not to be very beginning but one of the songs from that project i playlisted pretty heavy so it was just like a whirlwind of things at that time and oh since then my sound has changed and i got known for a sound and like abandoned it over time sure and i had been trying to find myself and i think part of me not having hobbies was like do i even know what i like do i know who i am and skateboarding was something i, I really loved as a as a kid and i've always resonated with the counterculture-ness of it um and through that and getting my sound into this alternative hip-hop alternative rock skateboarding working on how i dress it just helped me find myself again in a weird sure way and that's not what i thought was gonna happen from it at all yeah is that part of the reason you moved back i mean i know you said that it was like family and stuff yeah. but is that something you found with moving back to Rhode Island that you're just kind of in your own space and you can be more your authentic self again? I, I, I do believe so in the time I've been there. I, I it's, it's not a big place in Providence, Rhode Island. So a lot of people know me. It's like a familiar, familiarity. But like this summer, like a month ago, I did a skate slash performance event with my homie who I started skating with and he's big in the scene in Rhode Island. And just doing stuff like that really has helped me find myself again and i think my values just over time have changed from chasing something to just like doing what i like to do and if it comes to me it comes to me uh whether that's success or whatever uh i i I think yeah being home is another part of that do you like practice manifestation or any of that are you into all that type of stuff i'm super into self-help books and podcasts like i I really like, like, there's one called Founders that I, I listen to all the time. And it's just about, he reads autobiographies and just biographies about different founders of companies, whether that's um, the founder of Red Bull or Jeff Bezos. It just, there's so many. Yeah. And then he breaks down key moments and, like, practices of their lives and all that stuff. I'm on YouTube watching self-help stuff. Just all that stuff helps me get a better grasp of myself. I don't know if I'm much more into like meta- manifesting and and in meditating and maybe that'll be a part of my life but like uh things that do deal with mindset and how to deal with yourself and how you exist in the world and help me become more self-aware yeah I, i'm very into it. my friend greg lutzka pro skateboarder i've mentioned a few times he suggests on his episode everyone watch the movie the secret Are you okay. familiar with the secret no okay well this it's I'll show it to you, but it's a book that they turned into like a movie, like a documentary a while ago. Um, but really it's just, it's, it's, it's just about attracting things to you mm-hmm. rather than like chasing it. Right. And it's the yeah. same way we we're talking about at the beginning of this, about how being your authentic self and you enjoying the show naturally is what makes other people enjoy the show. And I think that translates yeah. to kind of anything in life. Let's talk more about this tour. So you're coming towards the end of the tour. What has been your favorite memory? Share a story from this tour, the one that sticks out as one of your favorite things from going on this one. Man, uh, honestly, my favorite part about tour is I'm naturally introverted. 
living in New York, I lived in New York for seven years. That helped me become extroverted because I had to do that to like figure out how to start a career off this. But um, being able to get that energy out and that outlet, I think me in real life versus me on stage are just two very different people. Uh, so there's that. Uh, one of the cool things I've been doing this this tour is, I don't know if I'll do it tonight. I just pick and choose, but I've been like doing kick flips on stage just <laughs> randomly. Sick. Just, I don't, I'm not sure why, but uh, my best moment from this tour, it was my birthday back on the 28th and we were in Bend, Oregon. I had like three microdose little capsules left and I just took them all at the same time and got like a small little like, about an hour, two hours just head. Not like a hallucinating like trip, but like just feeling one with the the earth. And we were hiking near this like waterfall and then we just kept hiking. And there was this big rock cliff in front of another waterfall. And I just got near the edge and just laid down and just hugged it for like 10 minutes and didn't talk to anyone. And I was, just, I kept re- repeating in my head, like, this is all there is. I was looking at a tree. I'm like, this one's like kind of tilted. I wonder how long that tree's still going to be there. And when it dies, it's just going to be part of this little land. And we're just going to be part of it. I was just having this amazing moment on my birthday while hiking. And Dude, yeah. I interviewed Daniel Donato. He's like a guitar sensation in like the country kind of world right Damn. like he's still really young and he's he's incredible um but anyways he lives out in like nashville area but he purposely bought a house kind of like way out mm-hmm. he said there's like no unnatural light if he turns his lights off there's like uh... nothing polluting it anywhere and he was just talking to me about like going back and looking at what are the things that made people happy 500 years ago mm. Because those are still something like normal and natural that humans would enjoy now. Right now we're like seeing things like likes and follows and, you know, you go whatever. And that gives you this like um, boost of endorphins all of a sudden that you're excited about whatever. But that's super unnatural. And you like people tend to chase that all the time. But if you really strip those things away and go, well, if we didn't have any of that, what would make me happy? And you go do those things. You'll find that those recharge you and bring you more happiness than almost anything else does. Just most people don't even try to go to those things. Yeah. I mean, if you don't know, you don't know. Like, I, I didn't have friends who, like, going on hikes when I was younger. My friends now do or, like, living in L.A., being exposed to more things. But I, I honestly, if I lived in Rhode Island, I don't know if I ever would have gotten to going on hikes. I don't even know if I liked hiking until this last hike yeah. we just took. Uh but it is it is very easy to overlook just the simple things. I think skating has helped me be outside more and be more in tune with just like, all right, I'm going to spend today just working on this trick. I'm not trying to go pro. I'm not trying to impress anybody. This trick is just for me. And if no one sees it, none of my, uh, my friends back home in Rhode Island skate. When I was living in LA, my friends did not skate. So it wasn't like I was going to be like, yo, I just landed a half cap flip for the first time. You need to see, like, yeah. I wasn't doing it for anyone. And I, I think in this world of optimization, uh, the unnaturalness of online being in our phones, it's, it, it's very easy to forget that just doing things for no reason is fine. Yeah. And I, I'm trying to embrace that more and more. Yeah, I think it's it's being intentional in general with your time and recognizing that not every moment of your life has to be working towards something necessarily. Yeah. You know, sometimes you need to intentionally take those breaks for you to have the energy to put into whatever that thing is that you're chasing, such yeah. as music. Like a lot of times you have to take yourself out of that. I want to get a couple more stories. So yeah. and I don't want to sit here and talk about Avi all the time, <laughs> but... Could. But with him, like he had announced that he's going to be walking away from music so that uh, he did this project with you and he's got apparently like one more album coming out. Yeah. I want to hear one story from you about the two of you. What's your favorite memory or what's a good story of you and Avi? doesn't have to be this tour. I know you guys have been friends for a while. Yeah. Honestly, I don't know if it's a good, I don't know if it's like a specific story, but we do just tend to wash each other on each other's songs. Okay. So, like, if he does a feature for me, it's us- his verse is usually better than mine. And if I do it for him, it's some of the best that I ever wrote. And I don't know why this keeps happening. And we both kind of mutually agree, like, you killed me on that one, or you killed me on that one. And that that's, that. I, I don't know if I have, like, an actual story, but that that's one thing every time I think about when we work together, it's, it's just that. And you're going to be super bummed that you're not going to be able to do that anymore. 
Is that why you have, you have one song where you guys are kind of purposely like jokingly dissing each other? Yeah. Is that part of the reason why? I don't think that's come between. <laughs> 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 but like, so like even 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 that song, I was writing my verse, and then I was like, "Yo, did you finish your version?" And he's like, "No." I'm like, "All right, cool. I'm gonna diss you in the last four bars. <laughs> you diss me on mine." I came up with that idea and he dissed me better than I dissed him. Like, <laughs> it, it just... Once again. <laughs> we had this, I don't know, it, it's, a, it's a natural a flow of things. And granted, like, he's still going to be producing. He's just not going to be operating as a hobby and being this artist thing anymore. Yeah. So I think he's just kind of transcend or wants to move on beyond it. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, I told you off mic about the skateboard shop thing. Mm-hmm. Like, I think it says something when you understand yourself enough to walk away from something that is currently successful mm-hmm. to go this is just no longer where my goals lie it's no longer what i want regardless of what everybody else wants yeah. it's just not what i want to do and it's it's hard to be able to do that so you guys just put out i should say just this is a couple months ago now oh, a month and a half yeah yeah so icarus the ep it's a six song uh album that's out everywhere there's a whole bunch to come with it like this sweatshirt that you're wearing yes, um you got a whole merch line and where can people go find that uh weirdofmouth.com okay why i like uh i've always tried i don't really like putting my name or names on like there's no nothing that says this is ours other than if you see the image i just like to make things that people um granted i didn't draw this but i like to make merch things that people can just wear regular people so like if you come to a show you're like oh i like this set I don't know if I want to wear Kari on my like shirt, but yes. oh, I like the the little guy on there. I mean, I bet there are a lot of people that would like to wear a Kari on yeah. the shirt. But... Yeah, but like, I just I figure it it's, it's a more com- it's a bigger conversation if I make something cool, or if I like the merch is something cool that someone might ask, like, why does that say intern? Are you an intern? Sure. Oh no, this is from a project called Intern Aquarium. Or why does your shirt say this is weird? It's like. Oh no! This rapper I went and saw. My favorite rapper has a project called "This Is Weird," or he says it a lot during his shows, which you'll probably see later if you're yeah. around. Um, yeah, I got a babysitter for the night. I'm hanging out now. Bet, bet, bet. <laughs> I, uh, I just, I, I, I generally think it's it is much more interesting to me to make something a conversation piece as opposed to a conversation about me. Yeah, well, sure, I could see that. So, what else is coming up? Are you working on another album to come out after this? Are you going to ride the wave of what you're on for a little bit? Uh, I have a hard time sitting around for too long. Uh, I have an EP. Well, we dropped the EP, and I have a mixtape called Uh, like a series I do. So, Uh, three will be the next one that'll come out this fall, slash maybe like December or something. It was, so, I was supposed to be dropping songs right now, but I just are, is a lot of it recorded already? Or yeah, most of it's recorded. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I got some songs with. Abby that haven't come out on there. Oh, cool. And then I have pretty much 60 to 70% of a a full album for next year. Which is what, dozen-ish songs is what uh, you consider? Uh, this one's probably going to be around 17 songs. Oh, wow. Yeah, I have okay. more than that for it. I've just been moving songs in and out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that's like me fully diving into alternative rock, hip-hop combination as a full project. And uh, I think it's one of the most important projects um, I've, I've, I've ever made. And are you shooting for what, like next summer? Next fall? Maybe this time next year. I, I, the way I'm similar to how we were talking about, just like not trying so hard. Right. I just like kind of uh, leave things in the air now, like where I'm going to drop a few songs. If it's time to drop the project, I'll drop it. I might even take songs out based on how they... I might make new ones. Like, I I like this idea of things just being ready when they're ready. That doesn't mean I'm not working on them. That doesn't mean... Like, I have enough songs to make the album. Forcing it. Just not forcing it. Like, I listened to Charlie XCX's Brad album, which is one of my favorite albums this year, randomly. Uh, just off the... She defined an audience. The lyrics contribute to the story of the girl, of the brat, and the world she created around it, whether that was promo. I listened to that and I was like, oh, I'm not done with my project. I need to like scrap a few songs, add a few songs. So I just, with albums, so I have the EPs, I'm a little more loose with mixtapes, I'm a little more loose with what al- when is, I'm making what I consider an album. Uh, I'm really particular, like to take my time and uh, I'm just going to let it shape itself. The skeleton's there, most of it's there. As far as when it comes out, what it ultimately ends up sounding like, um, 
I'm just gonna let the maybe I'm manifesting. Maybe yeah, I'm let the let the universe take it. But uh, I'm really excited. And I, I know it's my most important work um, of my career. Yeah, I mean the albums are what define your career when you look back on it. When it's all said and done, all the other things like add to it, but those are like the biggest pinnacles. Like bring back skateboarding, it's like yeah. the major video parts. It's like that's what defines your career and why you want to make sure those are the most important things. Very much. Um, let's pick one more song, but I want to hear the story about it too. What's your personal favorite song from the Icarus EP? And then tell me the story of how that one came to be. Uh, I think my favorite song, it changes a lot. But mine's The Void. I was going to say The Void, but see, The Void, we technically, I technically had recorded the chorus that's the only song that was kind of made before okay. he just wrote his verse in the sessions we were working on it but I'm, I'm gonna choose a wild card mobius it, it just it's the weirder song on there if you're going genre wise but like it just happened naturally and then the like the that's probably the one i played after you make a project you just usually play like a few one or two a lot that's just that first week after is the song I, I played a lot. Uh, I really like Abby's verse on that, and I really like the the hook I wrote on that one. And it, it just it fits with the project because it's small, but like it's the one that like if someone was to guess it was on the project, you'd be like, "Man, eh, that one's on there." Like, All right, cool. It's almost like this weird Catronada, introspective Catronada song sure. in the middle of this project, and I don't know. I don't know if it's my favorite, but it's the one I played the most when we first made it. Dope, dude. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. This was cool. I'm glad we were able to make it work. Of course, man. I, I feel welcome. Thank you for having me. It's my first time here. I got to go to the skate park down the street. Do you go to Amelia? Or the outdoor one? Outdoor one. Oh, cool. There's an indoor one? Dude, there's three? Four. Yeah. But Familia is the one owned by Steve Nesser that you see in like all the videos all the time. Oh, damn. I should look that one up. Yeah, dude. But no, I, th thank you for having me. This, is, this has been cool. Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Passion Pod. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We'll see you soon.